Hello everyone and welcome to RIOS. You all know why you're here. For the next hour we're going to be talking about nothing but sex and we've got a terrific panel of sex experts to answer all those questions you've wanted to ask but have been either too shy or embarrassed to ask. Um, I also wanted to thank you all for coming. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed the documentary. Did uh, everyone enjoy it? Yes. Yeah. Um, I hope it stimulated a lot of ideas. There were um, many issues that arose from making the documentary that we might discuss in the first 20 minutes of this session. Um, then we'll take a quick 10 minute break and uh, we'll open up the floor to Q&A. Um, so to everyone in this room and to you at home who are joining us um, through live streaming, please send in those questions or drop them down on a piece of paper and put them at the back of the room and hopefully we'll get to all of those questions um, throughout the session. So I might just introduce my panel. Here we have um, Dr. Parish, uh, Patricia Wirakun. She is a medical doctor and an internationally renowned sexual health expert. Um, she tells me that she's writing a book and she's also a committed Christian. And she's also been quoted as saying that our bodies were made for pleasure. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Patricia. Give her a round of applause. Next, we have Fiona Patton, who is the founder and leader of the Australian Sex Party. She's also the CEO of Eros Association. Um, that's Australia's adult retail and entertainment association. Um, she has over 20 years experience working with the adult industry and works with various NGOs and international uh, groups on issues such as discrimination, HIV, AIDS, and sexual disability. Please welcome Fiona. And last but not least, we have Alan Jenkins. He has over 25 years experience as a psychologist working with people with sexual concerns and he has a particular focus um, working with men on issues of violence and abusive behaviour and works with young people who've inflicted se uh, sexual assault. So we'll be able to hear um, the other side of the story. So please welcome Alan. One of the uh, issues that arose when making the documentary was trying to find people who would want to front up to camera to talk about such private and intimate issues. And as the doctor said in the beginning of the documentary, sex is still taboo. So perhaps I might open tonight's panel discussion by asking our sex experts whether or not they believe sex is still taboo in Australia. What do you think, Patricia? Sex is taboo in Australia or anywhere because it is a very intimate, I mean, where else or when else do two people actually get together, take all your clothes off and then, you know, bring two anatomical parts together so intimately in a sweaty, wet and moist environment. I mean, then you want to get out there and expect people to talk about it. Yeah. So it is a difficult area to talk about anyway. <coughs> But that makes it all the more important that when something especially concerns them, mm. that they should have an avenue to talk about it. Mm. So I mean, things like we're doing today are really important. Mm. You know, there's, we, we've, it seems that we've come a long way. You know, we've become open-minded about gays and um, mm. things like that. Um, Patricia, uh, sorry, uh, Fiona, do you really think that we've, we've come a long way or are we just kidding ourselves? I, 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 sadly, I think we are still kidding ourselves. Um, we're still extremely nervous about sex education. We still, in Australia, we ban the, the sale of films featuring two people having sex. Um, in fact, you know, if you were to sell a film like that in, in Adelaide or, or in most parts of Australia, you could go to jail. So, yes, we still seem to have, a, I think, a very perverse um, concern and suppression of sexual expression. Alan, you deal with people who've suffered from sexual assault. Um, what's your experience with them sharing their experiences with you? Uh, look, I think people talking about any aspect of sex are uh, generally uh, extremely reticent about talking about it. And, and, and I think we are living in strange times too, like where there's a huge expectation that, you know, we are 
overtly sexual in all sorts of ways and that we can perform in all sorts of ways. And yet, at the same time, there's a, a moral kind of uh, inhibit in, inhibition sort of aspect of culture too. And working with young people, I think they're very confused about how to be in the world. Patricia, you would have experience with this. You told me you're writing a book <coughs> on youth and yeah, sex. Yeah, I do a lot of work with teens, especially with the churches and with Christian schools. And so I'm writing a book on teens and sex, especially through what's called in Sydney Anglican Youth Works, which is the publishing arm of the Anglican Church. And you know, the, the thing with young people today is, one, they are biologically, they are sort of all sexed up but their control systems don't develop to the mid-20s. So there is a sort of problem there in just happening in their brains. And then we are in this sort of super sexualized culture. And you know, today we know the statistics are that uh, young people are first exposed to pornography ages 11 to 13. I mean, these are babies. These are babies who are being introduced to very sexual messages. And so what we are really getting out there is talking to parents and telling them, you know, sex education, one has to start at home, start with the parents, and share your values and your feelings with your children really, really young. So are you saying that pornography is a bad thing? Well, what I'm saying is that the research is coming out that pornography, especially in younger people, because you see, nowadays, again, coming back to the developing brain, we know the brain is very plastic. And what the research is coming out, especially in young people, is that what you're putting into the brain is going to be scripted into their brains. And there's research that has shown that, especially for boys, a lot of exposure to pornography can change how they frame their view of girls. I mean, I've talked to teenage girls who've told me that their boyfriends have asked them to groan like porn stars. Mm, mm. And I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, that is sad. I, 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 I don't think it's as simple as that. And I, I certainly, I've met, I mean, I'm, I'm so impressed with young men today. You know, and, and the, the young men that I meet at universities and at high schools, I'm, I'm really impressed with how they get along with girls, that, they're, that they have oh, yeah. great relationships and they have a, a much more equal status. And I think, you know, so many young men today have been raised by feminists and, you mm -hmm. know, we, I, I'm forever oh, they're surprised wonderful. And, and impressed they're by wonderful it. young people. Having said, I mean, however, I, I, you know, I, I don't want our young people getting their sex education from hustler.com. I, I want them to be getting good, honest, frank, real sex education mm -hmm. because porn is fiction. Mm. It's not real. And we, I would really like to see kids getting sex education from probably the minute they start school Correct. And, and throughout their lives. See, so that's where it is. It's fantasy. And so, you mm. know, if fantasy is your educator, I mean, I'm 65 mm. now, but I did not look like a porn star even when I was 15. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really I'm didn't. I'm sure you did. You know, I mean, there's, a million, know. And there's all different sorts of porn stars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I mean, that raises the issue. There has been some research recently, as Patricia mm. alluded, um, that there was a suggestion that watching too much pornography actually distorted a man's expectations of his partner in the bedroom, and this led to a lot of unsatisfi unsatisfying mm. sex for men because they did expect them to be or and do and behave just like porn stars. So, um, Fiona, do you not see that there could be a correlation there? Look, I. I, I certainly think we, you know, we are in a media revolution, and we can we are getting so much more media and so much more imagery than we were even just five years ago, mm. certainly ten years ago. Um, and, and again, I think in in that we have to prepare ourselves that you know this is fantasy, it is fiction. You know, porn is not real, and we really need to be educating about it. We can't ban it, um, we can't filter it. So we need to be preparing people to have a, a much better understanding and a, and a much sounder understanding of themselves and of their own relationships and how they work honestly in other relationships. Um, 
and you know hopefully maybe make some better porn along the way <laughs> but, um... <laughs> Alan do you what? think that pornography can alter people's behaviors in their relationships well a great many of the young people we work with who have um, uh, committed a sexual assault pornography has played a very big role in their lives mm. um, I think it's interesting one of the things that film triggered for me when those rare conditions was how easy it is to separate the, the mechanisms of orgasm and of sexual behavior from desire. Mm. And, and I think of how, like, to experience desire, you know, one needs to be able to, to sort of let go of self a bit, to reach out towards another. And um, what I see, you know, many of our young people in our, this program I work with, their preoccupations with pornography take them, as you were saying earlier, don't allow uh, and help them reaching out towards others, but are reaching in towards some sort of fantasy idea about what sex should be, some sort of notion about orgasm and performance and certain kinds of all sorts of behaviours, but not really a, a connection with otherness or a reaching out. And I guess that's what's missing in a lot of our education, that we give people the, the biology of it, and, <coughs> but we don't give them the emotion of it and the feelings of it, and we don't give that information. So, so, yeah, so kids are mm. getting that information from, yeah, from, well, from fairy tales mm. that happen to be sexually explicit. It's interesting you should say that because fairly recently, over the last year or so, that's because now I'm retired and I've got more time <coughs> to do it. I've been working with like youth groups and children in youth camps and we're just doing that. You know, we're talking about what does it mean, you know, when you desire someone. I mean, it's about, as Alan was saying, it's mm. this other focused rather than me focused. And what does it mean to fall in love? <coughs> you know, what does it mean really to form an attachment? And you know, today's young people, as Fiona was saying, they are so wise because they've, they've grown up in an information, they are, they are digital natives. So they know where information is. And so they don't want people to just tell them the biology, they already read it. And so they want the science and they want people to share their values and they want to know why they should do things. So, so what is the science of, um, love is it a, a, a rational thing or is it an irrational oh, where thing are we going to start <coughs> falling in love is really chemistry i mean all the research now indicates that when you see that someone special you have this burst of chemicals mainly dopamine wonderful chemical dopamine it sort of <laughs> makes you have this drive towards that one person and so you have all this wonderful you know the the, the palpitations and your dilated pupils you can't live without that person all that wonderful love feelings it also does things like really bring down your ability to make decisions so you sort of look at this person and you think Oh, he's wonderful. And all your friends are going like, what is she seeing in him? Because your decision making's all short. And you take the most crazy risks because you know your brain is sort of paralyzed your decision making when you're in love. So it's a wonderful thing. It can also become an addiction, which is why you get like stalking and we could talk forever. <laughs> I, I just going back to the film, um, I kept, you know, because you know, the women were said were told, "Oh, you, you know, you lucky thing," and you know, and I know when I've been speaking to to friends about the men, you know, they just they really most men were having great difficulty believing that you could get sick from having an orgasm. Mm -hmm. um, but it was I wondered. Uh, it reminded me of that kind of that hysteria. So at the turn of the century, mm -hmm. when you know, when women were sexually aroused or or um, or horny they were consi considered to have hysteria. And it actually reminded me that that was when the first vibrator mm. came, <laughs> was made. Mm. And now, I, I just kept thinking of these women having vibrators inserted into their yeah. bodies. <laughs> <laughs> sort of like, wow, this is so 21st century. Yeah. 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 
But just staying with the, with what we just watched, I think one of the things we need to be really, really careful about is that these are rare conditions. Mm. Because you see, you, you might watch something like that and think, oh my goodness, you know, this is what I have. Like, I come from Sri Lanka, but in the subcontinent, we have a condition which we see a lot of, and we call that semen loss syndrome. Because in like the ancient Sanskrit literature, the semen is very powerful. So if you lose your semen, then you know you're losing a lot of energy. And so we see young men who come after masturbation or after you know, a night erection and a night ejaculation, and they'll say that they feel a lot of the symptoms that are being said mm -hmm. as the post-orgasmic So illness. are you uh, thinking that perhaps it's not purely a physical condition, that there is a psychological element to it? Well, what I'm saying is, I mean, I know Dr. Waldinger and Dr. Goldman, I, I know they wouldn't put out something that mm. is not really, really well, well tested. Dr. Goldmeyer actually thought that there, there would be a psychological yeah. element to it, that these patients are naturally highly anxious mm -hmm. people and that these conditions can um, lead them into these situations yeah. because they're anxious people. So they did differ yeah, slightly on Yeah, but the, on the ones that we see, yeah. I mean, usually once they get married and they're able to get over that anxiety, and really it's a <coughs> guilt more than anything mm, else mm. because they're doing something that they feel they shouldn't be doing mm. because they're losing all this energy. Mm, mm. And so, you know, once they get married or they have a steady partner, they generally are fine. So there it's... We're yeah, sure it's psychological. Yeah, well, it's interesting you say that because Victor, the young Spanish boy, um, went to seek some medical advice about his condition and the doctor said, oh, look, you're just anxious. I think if you just concentrate on relaxing when you're having sex, then it'll all go away. And, you know, years passed and it was mm. undiagnosed for him. And as mm. he said in, in the documentary, it would just fade away after several days and it would just puzzle him. Um, it's with really the, interesting. With the women that were being treated, did they actually? I mean, once they were success, the successful treatment with the with the in, implant, did they lose all arousal? Um, they, most of these women that were being treated with the implant, mm. um, had pain as mm. their primary reason for having the implant. Um, Dr. Thierry Vankayi said that he wouldn't do such a radical procedure on someone that had just the arousal um, and these women ca complain of excruciating pain and mm. that's why he does See, it on these people yeah. and having said that he said there's only around a 70 um, to 75 percent success rate so even this mm. um, you know procedure doesn't work on everyone because the sexual pain syndrome is a well recognized syndrome, mm. dyspareunia, yeah. or pain during sexual intercourse in a woman, is a very, very recognized sim mm. Sim mm. syndrome, mm. and therefore mm. he's treating that. Mm. And mm. that's what I was watching and feeling a little confused, so I'm glad you're saying that, yeah. because it's not really the persistent genital arousal mm. that he's mm. treating, is it? No. It's Oddly pain. enough, we sell those TENS machines in adult shops. Do <laughs> Yes. <laughs> For other purposes, I guess, <laughs> yeah. for exactly the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you ever Pardon? see um, patients um, with things like sexual addiction or maybe get misdiagnosed with other conditions? Um, well, like, as I was saying earlier, I think these conditions on the film, you know, I have very little experience with them, mm. but um, the disconnection of um, orgasm and sexual behaviour with desire is really, really common. Mm. And right. like these mechanisms get disconnected in perhaps all sorts of ways, mm. physiologically, psychologically. Like the reason I was late coming here tonight was I was working with a couple and... Remember this is a live forum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you um, might reveal something. <laughs> and a situation where a... Uh, um, a woman discovered her partner uh, looking at uh, pornography on the internet and was distressed about this. Mm. And, and, and in speaking with them, it became really apparent that his sexual life had become more connected with the internet than with her. Mm. And, you know, she felt undesirable and, uh, and she'd started to lose a sense of desire as well. And it became really apparent that this man had 
focused and, in a sense, had taught himself more and more and more to be um, orgasming, uh, you know, watching quite specific images uh, mm -hmm. on an electronic medium. And, mm. and, you know, and I think many men I come across with who experience a loss of desire in a relationship, that's not an uncommon story. Mm. And, and I think these are the common stories of disconnection about, um, a re you know, orgasm, performance and desire that uh, uh, are very frequently observed. Yeah, and I think um, the communication has to really happen in that relationship. Um, Michael, um, the poise sufferer in the documentary, he's um, been married for 20 years and it wasn't until several years into the relationship that he actually revealed this to his partner and it was only when she confronted him and said, look, I think there's a problem in the relationship um, and there was a point at which they thought they might separate that he revealed he had this condition and when I asked him what her reaction was, he said she was relieved um, because it wasn't about mm. her, it wasn't that he wasn't sexually attracted to her and that it was mm. explained by this other condition. Mm. Um, and we're pleased that, you know, at least he had some good results with niacin. Yeah, it was only by amazing. chance that I told him that I'd spoken to the Spanish guy and um, who had results with taking this vitamin B. It's all still very up in the air and um, we can't explain it, but um, it seems to have worked for, I, for a lot of men. Yeah, I still, we were talking about this earlier, I'm still really interested as, as to whether they would be allergic to other people's sperm. Yeah, or yeah. You know, well, that was the thing that Dr. Dr. Waldinger own. didn't do a trial where he had control and yeah. sufferers. He just yeah. took 45 men and found that um, of this group of men that suffered from the condition, 88% of them developed this allergic reaction, reaction. under their skin. So there's st still some more work that needs to be done. And not everybody is getting results from this hyposensitization. Mm. Mm. Um, one person reported symptoms reduced by 90%, mm. but there's still a, quite a lot of them that um, mm. don't, uh, don't have any effect. I think the thing we need to remember is that this whole field of sexology or sexual health and sexuality is a relatively young field mm. and so we may think you know like sex has been around since creation right but you know the point is the whole scientific study of sex which we call sexology is a fairly young field mm. I mean, you get all the top experts together and you probably won't get more than about 200 in the whole world mm -hmm. so that's a very young small field so a lot of this is still still experimental, we are still not certain. I get quite concerned that we get overly kind of hung up and focused mm. on performance and orgasms and you know like the notion of what sex should be is really oppressive mm. and I, like I see men being really really overly preoccupied mm. with if sex is good for them then they've got to be having you know, they've got to be having orgasms and they've got to be having them every time and everyone's got to be a bit better than the next one. And, uh, you know, it, it, it um, you know, desire and even arousal mm. is quite a, a sensitive and fragile mm. thing, you know, and under these demands for what should be, mm. I think it's, uh, it's quite oppressive and uh, it limits uh, men's and women's ability to enjoy sex. All right, we might just leave it there and take a quick break so that you can all write down your questions and put them in the box at the back and then we'll open up for a Q&A session um, after a short break. Thank you. Um, just before we went out to a break, I think Alan was alluding to the fact that perhaps orgasm is not the be all and end all. Is that true? Absolutely. I I think it's often put forward that sex is about, you know, something called foreplay which then leads to something else which leads to orgasm and I think that idea of sex is fairly unhelpful really and it, it diminishes many of the things that I, I was talking earlier about working with people with spinal injuries who don't have any sensation below their waist and men who've learnt to have a really enjoyable sex life without having erections and orgasms. And, um, so you we're know. losing the intimacy. 
Okay. Sorry? We're losing the intimacy. Well, and there's also physical sensation all over your body, you know, mm. that gets lost when there's a, a sort of a one-eyed look at um, a penis and an erection and an orgasm. One-eyed look at that one eye. Yeah, that one eye. <laughs> Fiona, you, you work with um, sex workers. Yes. Um, what are their experiences uh, with this type of thing? Yeah, I mean, this is, and this is interesting, possibly not what would be expected, but very often clients are there for the intimacy rather than the orgasm. I mean, the orgasm gives them a reason to be there, but for the vast majority of the time that they're there, they're actually seeking that intimacy and they're seeking, you know, it's quite often a conversation, a one-on-one -on -one with with someone that they can be close to, albeit just for an hour. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I certainly you know know of cases where the the knock on the door, which is you know ten minutes left, sir, um, and they go, oh God, we better have some sex. <laughs> you know, and, um, I mean, certainly there's guys who you know get in, get off, get out, but. Um, I do find that a lot of men and 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 probably women as well are, are actually seeking the, the intimacy of a relationship, even if it's a temporary one. Is there also a chance that men visit sex workers because they feel that they can ask things of sex workers that perhaps they couldn't ask yeah, of their yeah, partners? Yeah, we used to have posters. I know in the, in the early '90s, which were sex workers were the sex educators of the world, and um, I, you know, it used to be as. A admittedly, a lot, a lot of sex worker clients are married, and I know a lot of sex workers who, used to, you know, they'd, the client would be going, oh, "My wife doesn't understand me; she doesn't like it." And you'd think, "Well, if you're doing it like that, no wonder." <laughs> um, <laughs> so maybe, you know, how about if you tried it like this, you know, or how about let her get on top? Or um, so I think, you know, and clients used to come back saying, "Well, I." Thank you. That went very well. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I do think that sex workers can play that education role, and that men, um, certainly with the first with the injections, penile injections, um, when they were first coming out, a lot of men felt more comfortable going to a sex worker mm. and using the injection mm. than they felt using it with with someone they weren't paying. But that's kind of. In a way, I mean, I'm glad the sex workers mm. are around. I mean, we've, we've talked about this before. Yes. But the point is, it really says something. It's really sad, isn't it, that we that couples haven't got the premarital education or they mm. haven't had the advice that they can't communicate and that the man has to go to a sex worker to communicate. And where does the woman go then? Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of, it's so sad that we have brought our society to that. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing I talk to in the churches. But I think it's, you it's, know, it's, our let's talk. it's still our repression, isn't it? That um, we don't feel comfortable talking about sex, even in our most loving relationships. Um, and I still think that's about a societal repression of sex that we really need to get over. I mean, it's like, We've lost the ability, as you were saying, Alan, of that intimacy. I mean, even in young people, it's like, you know, you can't be intimate with someone. It's like you can only, you can be sexual but not intimate. What are we, what's happened? Do you think we've lost, lost it? it? I mean, like, if you go back to the 50s, I mean, do you really think that people were more intimate in the 50s or the 40s? I mean, yeah. like, that's not how... It looks when I look at old sitcoms on telly, but... Um... I think it's amazing how many how many people maintain a sense of intimacy given the uh, you're probably yeah. right there the <laughs> pressures of how to think and feel about sex yeah yeah, yeah. well on the, on the subject of orgasm someone sent in a question um, asking perhaps to Patricia what are the primary causes of uh, what are the causes of primary anorgasmia this is a condition Somebody. where women don't experience orgasm Somebody at all. very well informed to give it the right name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the point with orgasms, and I'm assuming it's a woman, I mean, we're talking about women. We don't know, this is an anonymous question. Yeah, but we'll assume it's women. <laughs> because it's a big, big topic if you're going to talk about all orgasms. There's a lot of men don't care about women's right. orgasms. But, <laughs> but the point is that the research coming out from uh, the laboratories in Vancouver, Rosemary Basson, where she's 
talked about the female response cycle and what we talk about is that about only about 50% of women have vaginal orgasms with vaginal intercourse. I mean, they may have orgasms with, mm. you know, masturbation or oral sex. So there is again, as Alan was saying, this sort of drive, you know, I must have an orgasm. And a lot of these women who don't have vaginal orgasms would say that they have very satisfying sex. Mm. Now, again, coming out of a lot of good stuff coming out of Vancouver Laboratories, Dr. Laurie Brotto, who works on, you know, women who have primary anorgasmia, who can't have orgasms, usually vaginal orgasms. And we talk about women being just mindful, you know, mindful of enjoying sex for what it is, rather than striving for that mm -hmm. orgasm. So yes, it is a condition. But yes, it is being treated now with this, if you use the word treated, with like being able to just be in the moment and enjoy the sex rather than striving for the orgasm. Sometimes the orgasms happen. Sometimes they never happen, but you enjoy the sex. Someone asked the question, um, are women just not wired to have orgasms or to have G-spot orgasms? And are some women wired okay. that way? Um, couple of questions there, and that is that those days we thought there were two types of orgasms, a clitoral orgasm and a vaginal orgasm. Now they say, no, I am not mean an orgasm is an orgasm. Firstly, what is an orgasm? I mean, you know, it's orgasm, just... Orgasm, uh, schmorgasm. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, I do talks all over, I've done it in all over the world, and you sort of hands up everybody who has had an orgasm and nobody puts their hands up. <laughs> so we get this anorgasmic... Uh, or, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. But the Still, point that's is, like two people. Still, it's only like three people in the room. But the point is, an orgasm is basically the muscle contractions and that build up of tension, and then this feeling of release. Of course, there is a chemical basis. There's oxytocins and dopamines and endorphins released. That's why you feel so good after an orgasm. But the point is that the what is there a G spot? Anatomically and histologically, I'm also an anatomist apart from being a doctor and a sexologist, and we haven't located one. Now maybe it's the sort of developmental leftover bit of the male prostate, but we don't can't sort of locate sort of where exactly that G spot is. <laughs> we don't know one. You need a longer <laughs> finger. Yeah, <laughs> Perhaps it should be called a Y spot. A yeah. Or where? Oh, yes. <laughs> but that's the point. I mean, you know, if you're striving for your G spot, stop. Because it could be like a where spot. And, but the point is to just enjoy the moment mm, mm. and the satisfaction. Mm. Because, you know, an orgasm is not. And that's what we all keep there forgetting is. to teach people is to enjoy it. Mm. And you know that it's it's part of this experience and it should be enjoyed and yeah as you say you know the final sh <coughs> when eye meets eye moment um, <laughs> is not necessarily the, the, the most important part <laughs> I good for the anonymity isn't it experienced it with some friends of mine so I'm not, not personally but you know mm. talking about it. they say that the orgasm mainly happens in the head Mm. Your main mm. sex organ is between your ears, <laughs> not between your legs. Your well mind done. Mind yep. That actually produces the. Organ. Well done. Mm. Would you would you comment on that? Well, Absolutely that's the true. point. <laughs> <laughs> we have already commented. She your concurs. main sex organ is between your ears. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone wrote in a question asking, um, "Is it strange in a relationship where the stereotypical roles are reversed, where the man is barely interested in sex and the woman wants it all the time?" Um, Alan, have you come across that? Well, I, I think frequently, uh, you know, I work with people with men who. They're not really, they, I mean, they're performing in sex. You know, they're having erections and they're doing things according to what they should. But in terms of a sense of enjoyment or a sense of desire or a mm. sense, mm. you know, it's often quite lacking. Mm. And they feel kind of bad about that too. So are you saying that they're lacking libido or is this something entirely different? Well, you know, in, in terms of what is libido, but. It, 
uh, you know, I, I think there's such a preoccupation with a great many of these men about what sex should be. Mm. And, you know, growing up as a young man, you're bombarded with information about, you know, what you should feel desire, how you should feel desire, to whom you should feel desire, what that person should look like, act like, be like. Mm. And uh, the expectation, then of course they're reciprocal for women, obviously, mm. but uh, I think it's, it's quite miraculous that we can maintain <laughs> libido and, and, or a sense of desire under those conditions. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a tribute yeah, to the resilience of uh, people. Yeah. It's interesting that there was a recent, there was a sex census and it was an online census and 15,000 Australians um, participated in it, which was, you know, so it's quite a nice snapshot. Um, and it showed that I think over half the women of Australia were pretty satisfied with their sex lives, but only 30, 40, 30, under forty percent of men were. Um, which is that related to quality or quantity? It was just, are you satisfied <coughs> with your sex life? Um, they then asked people how many, how much you would like to have, how much sex you would like to have, and you know, probably unsurprisingly, everyone kind of went, I don't know, a couple of times a week was just sort of the general consensus in Australia. Well, it's amazing how often people ask, what is the right yeah. number mm -hmm. of times? As, as though there is as, a, as though there number, is a right yeah, number of times, right. you know, or yeah. there is a right frequency. But I, I also think never has there been a time when young men, it's so available, a range of sexual and from the weird to the mm. bizarre um, materials, that are just available at the click of a mouse. Yeah. And, you know, like I think the influence of that on just what sex should be and what attraction should be and what desire should be, you know, I think we're just starting to see some of the effects of that. We've got a, quite a few questions on libido. One of the questions asks what controls a woman's libido and how can these mechanisms be uh, influenced in order to increase the woman's sex drive. You're looking at me, so I have to respond <laughs> to that. Uh, I think that again goes back to the female and male sexual response cycles. And today we do know that men and women are different. Surprise, surprise. It's like needed researchers to write about it to tell us this. And what we know is that there are a fair number of women, and this is not all women, but there are a large number of women who would go into sexual activity from what we call a state of neutrality. In other words, they are not like swinging from the chandelier to have sex, <laughs> but they're sort of they're going, going beige or pasty yeah, beige. Yeah, they're sort of, <laughs> no, they're actually going like, darling, I'll, I'll go into sex because I like being with you or I like being intimate with you. I, I talk about it like, you know, somebody invites you out to have a hamburger and you're going like, I'm not hungry, and even if I am hungry, I think I'd like a Thai green curry instead. <laughs> but, but, you know, I really enjoy being with you, and I love you, and I want to be intimate with you, so let's have a hamburger. You take one bite of the hamburger, and it's like, oh, what a hamburger. I think I'll stay for the rest. And so women, many women, wouldn't feel that crazy desire. But once they get started, they get aroused and then they feel desire. So it's sort of an upside down response cycle so for some reason. Patricia, do you, uh, do you support Prue, uh, no, I mean, Prue God. Um, Prue God? Uh, no, no, not oh. Prue Goward. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be then. furious if I said <laughs> her position on orgasms. But um, <laughs> no, her name's just escaping. The woman who's just said, who's written the book. Bettina. Bettina, oh, okay. Bettina who's saying, Look, women, just get over Put it. Put the O's you know, in and roll. Throw the leg over and, you know, take one for the team. Well, and, you know, <laughs> see how we... And, and life will be, you know, immeasurably what we better. Say, what we say is, look, it's not that sort of mechanistic. I mean, a woman needs to be romanced. I mean, the man needs to be the oh, romancer. No. And it is okay. It is okay to be romanced. I mean, you know, but there are times when you sort of want to jump the man, and that's okay too. <laughs> but there are times when you like being romanced. And it is okay to be at different at different times, Ellen. I mean, you know. 
Is <laughs> that <laughs> not your person? Eh? But in your practice, I mean, you know, it's no. okay to be. Definitely, I, I think the idea of inventing what feels good is yeah. a bit out of fashion, yeah. you know, and uh, I'm all for it. And so when we get back to the libido question, mm. I mean, the point is we still don't have a drug for mm. female libido. Mm. We've tried to find a pink Viagra, but we haven't. Mm. So the, all the research has there's sort of some research coming up on a new drug, but nothing definitive mm, mm. from Kinsey Institute places have yeah. done. So we don't have a drug yet. So you talk about the disconnect between uh, men and women. What about same-sex relationships? Very little research yeah. being done on same-sex <laughs> relationships. Surprise, surprise. I mean, hey, funding. But, um, you know, when it comes to desire, I don't see why it sh anything should be different, whether it's falling in love or desire. I mean, the mechanisms, I would think, would be the same. There's a couple of questions here about what the best way um, is to avoid conflict when speaking to your partner about um, a lack of sex drive or too much. Um, sexual desire in the relationship. <laughs> how, do you, how, do you best, how do you best approach your partner about this? Well, see, I, I'm not a great believer in avoiding conflict either. Yeah. I mean, what's wrong with having some conflict? I think people, many people I see, that's the problem. They have avoided conflict. They've yeah. avoided talking about anything they think might offend the other or might upset the other or... Uh, you know, and so they don't talk. They got to that point in the you know, they don't have an argument. They don't. They don't. Uh... An argument's good because then it can lead to make-up sex. That's right. <laughs> I, you know, I used to. Um, I used to run a thing called the Love Bus, and I used to take women to adult shops and brothels and big warehouses. And um, when I first started doing it, a lot of women had never been to one. And um, you know, the first comments was that their husbands would bring home the porn and, and when they saw this huge shot, they went, wow, there's so much better stuff than, you know, than what he's bringing home. But women used to also tell me that, that they found it as a really good conversation starter, that if they instigated with a video, they'd go, mm, that looks interesting, doesn't it? Mm, should we do it, try it that way? Um, and that they found that was a, this was, these were women in their probably 40s, this, and this is 10 years, 10, 15 years ago, and they, yeah, they found this is a great way of, of, of introducing um, the conversation. I wonder whether women might be more interested in diversity and things mm. like, you know, whereas I think my experience being a man is that... Vegemite sandwich. It's very reductive, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and very much like when men get into pornography on the whole, they like having sex with themselves. It's their own fantasy mm -hmm. about what should be and what a woman, you know, what or yeah. what a man is if it's the same sex kind of interest. But um, you know, like I wonder, mm. I want, not having been a woman, I don't <laughs> have an answer to that. But, but what they say is that women are again. I mean, there isn't a lot of research, obviously, mm. in porn. But uh, women are more into like relational porn, so they would watch where there is a bit yeah. more relational rather than the wham bam thank you man look i actually think that's a myth is it yeah okay. i think that's a myth um look certainly we like good lighting but <laughs> i don't yes. think we necessarily need to to get you know I, I, what i'm seeing in in women making porn at the moment and what oh, and, what, and what and what women are buying is um is is not that kind of romance series where you know everything's lovely and you know it's not the pool guy it's this really rich lawyer and um <laughs> you know it's this big long story and then there's a bit of sex and you don't actually see much that women do want are enjoying the explicitness are enjoying something that is um is a lot more raw than mm than we think they want. Again, I mean, we are not talk There is no research. I mean, we are, you, you were saying what women are buying. So yeah. the well, women who are buying research, that are yeah. the women who are going to buy it. Yeah. But when you talk, it's about getting population samples as to what they would prefer. Well, so, let's just say the people so who watch real. this stuff, this is yeah, what yeah. they like. So that's the point. Yeah. So but again, it's not, it's not watch. hard to see what the predominant, poor, not, you know, nature of pornography sure. is. I mean, that, what you're talking about is a, a minuscule right. 
amount of the pornography market and yeah, I well, what do you mean by that? Like, I, well, I mean, well, I'm, I'm saying quite raw sex, and I think a lot of um, adult material is quite raw. But no, what you're saying is that the, the population of people <coughs> who would go and buy that, when you say women go and buy it, there's only a certain I, I'm talking number about of women pornography that might have a relational focus or an interest in yeah. otherness or an interest in mm. diversity. I think is pretty limited. Mm. Mm. You look at Suicide Girls, um, there's a whole bunch of, mm. of adult material that really is looking at the, a very diverse community. I mean, there's disabled mm. porn that's really popular. Um, Alan, mm. someone asked the question, why do you think sex and violence are so often linked? Um, I think they're the opposite and should be separated completely. Well, we have a, do you think? We have a poster in our waiting room that has Love Begins Where Violence Ends. And, um, but I think unfortunately sex and violence do get linked in very obvious ways in, in me, uh, the whole notion of whether you look at it as a cultural idea and the influence of patriarchy in a modern culture which is quite hierarchical and with a sense of men being expected to be in a position of authority in it. Uh, yeah, I think there are so many factors that link control, coercion, violence, sexuality, apart from the very obvious stuff that you see in some pornography. Mm. Uh, like I think it's quite curious again, I see, come back to this point, that many young men I work with can actually see through that and can actually become interested in connection with mm. and, and, and are not totally in the thrall of some of these ideas. Mm. Sorry, I've forgotten the question though. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the fact that sex you and violence are, are oh. often oh, linked, okay. uh, which you, you've answered. Um, someone has asked the question, um, how do you get past sexual assault and the feelings associated with it so that you can have a normal relationship with mm. someone in the future? Well, probably one of the big problems with sexual assault, apart from the violence and all of the obvious, is that the person who's <laughs> assaulted generally winds up making meaning out of it, mm. that it's something about them, mm. it's something wrong with them, there's something shameful about them, there's something culpable about them, mm. and, um, and there's a sense of worthlessness often that um, mm. is... Um, becomes attributed and so a person can go into their lives feeling their body is a site of shamefulness, that there's not much good about them and it's often that being able to relinquish that sense of being able to see the politics of sexual assault. <coughs> it is somebody using power, somebody using authority, somebody using not sex for sexual purposes yeah. but sex to control, sex to dominate, sex to oppress. And to be able to recognise that and see through this. I worked with a young man who was sexually assaulted and he was telling the story of, and he, it was a church youth group leader that assaulted him and he had this sense of absolute shame and worthlessness. And it was when he was starting to tell the story about um, how he was set up by this guy and this guy would let him drive his car at the age of 13, you know, in return. And he, I was, I was asking him, you know, to think of a time, like, because he'd said, that's right, he'd made a comment, he said, look, I realise he was now that he was trying to bribe me, but I really wanted the things he gave me. Yeah. And of course the emphasis was on, for him, was I really wanted, you know, it's my fault. Mm. And I asked him about bribe and I said, well, you know, how did you, uh, tell me about bribe. When, when did you work out it was a bribe? How did you work out it was a bribe? And he had this image that came into his mind and he saw this man handing over the keys to his car. Mm. And I asked him to look, what tells you it's a bribe? And then he saw it. He said, I can see his smirk. Yeah. Mm. And then he knew, he knows and I don't. And that was a real turning point, you know? There was a sort of a owning of, yeah. he was done too. It wasn't, mm. This wasn't his fault, you know? And I think yeah. moving past sexual assault is kind of starting to see through the, poly the power relations yeah. of this and to actually own your own ground and refuse to mm. 
accept that. And that it's very often not about sex, it's about power. Mm -hmm. Someone has asked the question, um, you've worked with uh, individuals who've inflicted sexual assault. Um, someone has asked the question whether or not castration would cure things like pedophilia. Well, again, that's a, a curious idea because there have been many attempts, not so much in this country, but in North America to, uh, to sort of chemically try and do that with uh, hormones and various other synthetic materials. And that's quite interesting that you don't need to have arousal or a penis erect to sexually assault somebody. You know, like, I think it's sometimes confusing the idea of sex and arousal and violence. And we need to really disconnect these two because they need to be disconnected. Okay, good words. Um, just moving on to something more physiological. Patricia, someone has asked, what are the physiological reasons for a dry vagina that leads to painful intercourse for a woman? And does that also cause pain for a man? It's a couple of things there. Firstly, painful intercourse can be due to many things other than just a dry vagina. It's conditions called, the whole thing is called dysperionia. It just means painful sexual intercourse for a woman. But what we have is, it can be due to a condition called vaginismus, which is just a contraction of the muscles around the pelvis, pelvic region in a woman, and that is causes pain. So pain itself is another issue, and that comes back to the surgery that our doctor was doing on the pudendal nerve. But a dry vagina, a couple of things. One is postmenopausal because your hormones are down, and therefore your your secretion of the vaginal fluids are less, so you're dry, so you need a bit of lubrication. Saliva is a great lubrication. This is what I tell people when I'm counseling them, older people. But the other thing is, if a woman isn't sufficiently aroused, I mean, if she's dry because she's not aroused, and that can be cause discomfort for her. Now, can it be uncomfortable for a male? Yes, it can, especially if he's an uncircumcised male, because when you go into a dry vagina, especially if it's tight and you're not circumcised, your foreskin can get pushed back and that can be painful and can cause pain in the male. So yeah, that's a physiological reason. Again, I, I've spoken to young women and certainly people have come into adult stores and have spoken about this. And you know, of course the first thing you go, well, here's some Swiss Navy or if you prefer KY, you know, and it comes in all different sorts of flavors. But I, I've heard women or men say, oh, no, 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 I can get her wet. Or mm. there's, there's this kind of this thing mm. that you know, you're not doing it right if, if a woman needs lube. And it's, you know, you know with, with safe sex and things like that, we've really got to get that mm. message out. Lube is good. It is you okay. Know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's okay. Mm. It is That's okay. Right. All right, well, on that note, I think we better wrap up. <laughs> Lube is good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for those uh, stimulating questions. Mm. Thanks very much. Also, please help me in thanking our sex experts this evening. And of course, to this wonderful institution, the RIOs, for hosting this magnificent event. Well done.